So that's a way to um, view things, and those things we'll see in the next slide, right? So there's different ways we can look at it. And one of them, uh, I think the one I showed, the example I showed last time was a mud weight window, a delta P, in terms of orientation. And here what we'll look at is an example An example. So these are the contour plots plotted on top of those lower hemisphere projections for these material properties uh, and, and state of stress, rather, these state of stress. And what you're looking at here, the color contours represent the required CO with a more Coulomb, the required uncombined compressive strength with a more Coulomb uh, failure model. This is the minimum required unconfined compressive strength at which we you would not observe any breakouts. Okay? So remember that just because you see a tiny little breakout doesn't mean you're going to have an unstable well. But what this is is the, you know, but it, certainly if you have a rock strength that's above the required CO, then you will not see any breakouts. And if there's no breakouts, you'll absolutely have a stable well, right? So what these are way, you know, what these plots are just sort of, uh, visual cues as, as to, you know, dangerous locations, if you will. So, for example, in this reverse faulting regime, if you were to drill horizontal wells in the direction of SH min, if you were to drill horizontal, remember, this outer concentric ring is 90 degrees, so those would be horizontal wells. So if you were to drill horizontal wells in the direction of SH min or in this reverse faulting regime, you'd have to have a very strong rock. To not, or uh, you'd have a very strong route to not observe any breakouts. But in general, what you can think of this as a way to sort of say that you know, these are regions of potential problems. And the red areas and the blue areas are your, your kind of safety zones, if you will. And so you know these are really quick ways that you can just sort of get a picture of you know if your if your plan was to drill. Uh, a, uh, one second. You know, if, you're, if your plan was to drill say, a, a horizontal well uh, at this azimuth for some reason, you might say, "Well, if I could just if I can just get away with going from the south, you know, the southeast, just east, if I could just deviate the well to the east a little more." then I'd be in a much safer region than I would be here with, you know, with respect to break. So these are ways to sort of get a quick visualization of problem areas. And so what I thought we'd do, because you're going to have to do on your next homework assignment, you're going to have to create a similar plot. It's not necessarily a required CO, but a similar plot, a lower hemisphere projection plot. I thought we would try to basically recreate this figure here in MATLAB. And so last time, I think it was on the Friday, we, we, we looked at this. Right? Was, it, was it Friday or was it Wednesday? It was before spring break. We looked at this and basically I had written uh, a series of functions that take us, again, we're given the stress, right? The input's here. Look here. The stress are the principal stress. Okay. Now here I don't have the exact angle. Like I don't really know the exact angle, but uh, I can I can guess. Right? I can sort of guess what that angle is. So I'm, we're given the principal stresses and orientations. At least uh, I can guess close. I'm given delta p. I have to make some assumptions on the what the rocks. Uh, properties are to re reproduce that plot exactly because all the details aren't in the, in the book. Uh, you know, these, these come from this page in the book, but I can, I can get close. And so, uh, again, we're given the stress in the principal stresses. We want to take them into the geographic coordinate system. So this is the same rotation. So this is a function that does that, right? Given S and the geographic angles, alpha, beta, gamma, return the stress in the geographic coordinate system. This function you should already have. 
Did you use it on your first test? And everyone did really well. So the next thing is now we, the stress is in the geographic coordinate system. Let's go into the well bore. So this is a, the delta in feet. So this takes the well bore angles. It also takes the geographic angles. So what I did here was actually this function. Uh, this function actually takes as an argument the, the stress and the, the principal stresses, and then takes the well bore angles and the geographic angles. And <coughs> There's the rotation matrix for the delta theta that takes us into the well bore from the geographic angles. And then I just call the compute SG from within it. So, I, so SG, I call it there, and then I use it here, and I, this returns the stress in the well bore. That's the stress in the well bore in Cartesian coordinates, right? And then I had uh, a function called compute well bore stress. So Compute well bore stress, takes an effective stress, the Poisson ratio, and the angle theta, that's the angle around the well bore, and uh, converts into, from Cartesian into polar coordinates. And then I had uh, functions for computing the minimum and maximum tangential stresses. Right? And so, compute the minimum. Or maximum in this case tangential stress. I first compute the well bore stress. Remember this is at a given angle theta, and then I can return the maximum tangential stress at that point along the well. Well bore. Right. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a more Coulomb failure criterion. Now remember the the more Coulomb failure criterion, right? Is like on the sigma 3, sigma 1 axis, we, we assume there's a line like that. That line has some slope, which we'll call Q. And this point, uh, sorry, this should be a, this should be sigma 1, sigma 3. So this, the, the, the y-intercept here uh, is C0, the unconfined compressive strength. And then, you know, with that, the more Coulomb Failure criteria is that sigma 1 equals C0 plus Q sigma 3, where Q is a function of the angle of internal friction, which is the, how the, the material property that, <coughs> how these things are typically characterized, and mu squared plus 1 plus mu squared. Right. So then if we solve this equation, right, for CO, because we want to compute the required CO, then we have this guy. Right? So in order to know the required CO, we have to know at least well, sigma 1 and sigma 3 and the angle of the friction. In this case, for those plots that I'm trying to recreate, I don't really know it. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess what you know, appropriate value of the rock, and we'll just see how, how the plot turns out. Okay. Um, okay. So that's what we want. That's our goal is to do this compute CO. So I'm going to create a new function and I'll call evaluate. CO. And so this is going to return CO. The name of the function is evaluate CO, and it's going to take as arguments the stress tensor, the well bore angles, that's delta and phi. The geographic angles, alpha, beta, gamma. I need the Poisson ratio. I need the angle of internal friction. So that's nu and mu. Uh, the pore pressure and the mud weight. Okay. So again, I think I told you several times. The way I code is I write small functions, right? So I've I've written these other small functions over here and I tested all those so I know they're correct. 
And then I'm just going to call them from within this, okay? So the first thing I need to do is I need to get the stress in the well bore, okay? And so the stress in the well bore, I'm going to call compute SB, which takes the stress tensor and the well bore angles and the geographic angles. Right. I need to compute uh, delta P, so I'll, I'll call this delta P. That's the pore pressure minus the mud weight. Then I can compute the effective stress in the well bore, so SB effective is equal to SB minus the pore pressure <coughs> times the identity matrix. Q, that's the slope of the Mohr Coulomb failure quark criterion in the in the sigma one, sigma three plane, it is the square root of mu squared plus one plus mu, and all of that is squared. Okay. Now remember, when I compute the minimum and maximum, so remember, I'm looking for the three principal stresses first. One of them is delta P, which we already have. The other one is uh, the minimum and maximum tangential stresses. Okay. And in order to compute those, I need... Um, I need, as an argument to those functions that I wrote, the angle theta. And I think if you were here on Friday uh, before spring break, when we, all we did was we, we, we plotted uh, as a function of theta, right? So, so you, you saw the minimum maximum trend, tangential stresses oscillate as you go around the wellbore. Now here we're just trying to determine if there's breakout or something associated with breakouts. We're trying to find the minimum CO, the minimum uncombined compressive strength of the rock that, in which there would be breakouts, right? And so what we need to do is we need to actually then search around the entire well bore. We need to search around the entire well bore to determine where the minimum and maximum tangential stresses are at a minimum or maximum. Right? We want the extreme values. That's where breakouts are going to occur. Remember, breakouts don't occur randomly, right? We, we know where, exactly where they're going to occur in vertical wells. Where do breakouts occur in vertical wells? Hmm? I heard a lot of mumbling. But somebody said, I, I, I told you this is going to be a test question, so you better know it. Hmm? They occur at they occur at the azimuth of SAP. Well, breakouts don't really open. Breakouts are caused by compressive failure of the rock. You're thinking tensile fractures, right? That's different. So the two failure. In a breakout, we're squeezing the rock so much that it, it exceeds the strength and it fails. All right, so, so that's in a vertical well. But now we have an arbitrarily oriented deviated well. And in fact, my function takes the, I mean, my function has to be general enough because it takes arguments of the well bore angle delta. So I can't make any predetermined decision about where the well bore, uh, about where the the uh, breakouts are going to occur because I don't even know the angle of deviation, at least when I'm writing this function. I don't know it yet. Right? Those are going to come as arguments to the function. Inputs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to search around. I'm going to look at discrete points <coughs> along the well, around the well bore, and I'm going to evaluate the CO, or the minimum maximum transitional stresses, at, at all of those points. Right? And so I could do it at every five degrees, every 10 degrees, you know, whatever I feel like, every half degree. It's up to you. 
I think it's adequate. It's adequate enough resolution. You probably just look at it every degree, right? So I'm going to write a loop that's going to go around, right? So I'm going to say for theta from 1 to 360. And the reason I don't say 0 to 360 is because that's the same point. Right? So, but 1 degree, 2 degrees, 3 degrees. And this is probably overkill, but the code's going to run fast, so it's not that big a deal. So for theta from 1 to 360, evaluate the maximum tangential stress. And the arguments to that function are the effective stress, Poisson ratio, theta, and delta p. So this, this, this function is going to get called 360 times for every theta as I go around the world. So that's the maximum. Then the minimum will have a different equation coded up for the minimum tangential stress of a different function. So then sigma one, that's our maximum principal stress, is going to be the maximum of there's only three principal stresses, st min, st max, and delta p. So sigma 1 is going to be one of those three. And because we order them from min to max, it's going to be the maximum of those three. Right? So this should be delta p. That's what I called it. Now, of course, ST min is never going to be greater than ST max, so I could definitely do that. But, you know, we're not trying to write this code as efficiently as possible, and I, and I think you know, determining what the maximum of three numbers is versus two is a, you know, sort of, uh, you wouldn't even notice. Uh, in the in the speed of the of the code, and then it, that allows me to just copy and paste and switch this min to a max and one to three. So sigma three is the minimum principle. So the minimum of the three principles. Right. So then. So then I have sigma 1 minus q times sigma 3, and I can end the for loop. So there, at every point 360 times around the well, it's 359. It's 359 times around the well, I'm evaluating the required CO. So this is, a, this is a loop. That's not one value of CO. That's 360 values. So what I'm looking for is the minimum required CO. Right? That's, that's sort of the, the minimum rock strength at which you could expect to see no breakouts. Anything greater than that, you know, you're just going to expect to have more stability. Right? So it's, it's sort of we're looking for the extreme case here. The minimum value of unconfined compressive strength at which you would see breakouts. And so what I really want is the minimum of those 359 cases, right? I'm evaluating the required CO all the way around, and I want to know the minimum of those 359 cases. Turns out, there, if I did things right, there are probably going to be two. Breakouts are going to, you're going to have the same set of stress at opposite angles as well. But due to round off errors or something in the way that, that you know, this, this function is called, or it may see a the 17th decimal place, one that's actually bigger or smaller than the other. It's going to return one value. All right, so how can I do that? How can I compute the minimum of those 359 cases? Hmm? 
this is just a single value. Right? So here, min is a list. I'm computing the minimum of these three things. Right? So what should I do? Should I store the 359 values? I can store them in an array, right? So I loop over. I can store them in an array, I'll have 359. And then outside this loop, I can compute the minimum of that array. That's one way to do it. That's not how I'm going to do it. Exactly, compared to the previous value. I need an initial guess, though. What's the, what's the zero value? How about we choose some number that we know is going to be bigger than the second, than the next value, than the first value? What number do I know is going to be bigger? A billion? Are you sure? <laughs> what about 10 billion? What about the biggest number the computer can store? Anybody know what that is? So the MATLAB is a function, real max. That's the biggest number my computer can store. That's a big number. A billion, ten to the Big number. So that's the biggest number. The, big, the, the biggest number your computer can store might be different uh, if you have a 32, 64-bit processor or whatever. Right? So that's the biggest number my computer can store. And so I'm going to initialize C0 to that number. And then I'll compute the minimum of C0 and whatever the current value is. So every time through, you know, so the first time through, this is the, the biggest number the computer stored, so this is guaranteed to be smaller than that. And then, so this will take on that value, and then it'll compare it to the previous value every time. And eventually, I'll pick up the true minimum as I go around the well bit without having to store a loop, and without having to store the data. And this is just better. I mean, three, it's not a big deal to store an array that's only 359 entries, but <coughs> let's say I want to be super precise. And I went, instead of going in, in, in increments of one degree, I went in increments of one ten thousandth of a degree. Right, go all the way around. So then I have 360,000 entries. <coughs> 360,000 entries. Now that's a bigger deal. I've got to store this big array and, and compute the minimum. I don't really want to do that. This, this would be a better way to do it. Because all I'm interested in is the true minimum. Okay. So we can save that function, and then we should be able to um, create our plot. So I'm actually going to uh, create a, another function to create the plot. I'll call it create lower hemisphere plot. CO. It's going to take S. It's going to take the geographic angles, nu, mu, pp. PM. And I'm going to add an additional argument that I'm just going to call n. This is going to be a way that we can control the resolution of the plot. Right? So if n is a big number, I'm going to have a really resolved, fine looking plot. But if n is a small number, uh, I'm going to have a much coarser plot. And, and the reason for doing this is for debugging purposes. Uh, if, if n is huge, you're going to see why. If n is really big, uh, it's going to take a code a, lo a long time to run. And when I'm debugging, I don't want to do that. I just want to get through it quickly, right? So, um, yeah. Oh, by the way, I, I'm just I'm just opening the file. I don't need to uh, create the argument li list yet, but I'll copy that. So I'm just opening the file here, and then uh, the file is going to be function. Uh, and I'll copy paste that in. And so now what I want to do, I want, again, this visually represents all possible combinations of phi between 0 and 90 and theta between 0 and 360. 
So uh, phi is going to be, I'm going to create a, li a linear space that goes from 0 to 90, and I want n increments. So if n is 25, there'll be 25 increments between 0 and 90. If n is 90, then, then, then b will be in degree, in one degree increments. One, two, three. Uh, delta goes from 1 to 360 in n increments. Uh, and so then I'm just going to say for i equals 1 to n, or j equals 1 to n. I want to evaluate C0 and should have that open. The arguments, the argument list there, I'll just copy it. So uh, now, in this, I copied it, but in this case now, uh, my wellbore angles are what I'm actually looping over, right? So my wellbore angles are delta i phi j, and all the other arguments are passed through. Right? So the geographic angles, nu, mu, Difference in pore pressure, they're all passed through. You know, you know what I mean when I say pass through? Like they're, they're the same arguments as the arguments of the function I'm writing. So the, the numbers that I plug into this function will get immediately plugged in there. And so I'll have a, uh, basically C0 for every discrete point on the plot for every potential beta and phi. Now, uh, so I want to create a contour plot, and contour plots in uh, in MATLAB are like on a a, Carti or a Cartesian grid. Right? So I'm sweeping over this in polar coordinates, right? but I need a contour plot on a Cartesian grid. <coughs> so if you remember, so again, I'm, I'm looking for contour plots or values like x, y, and z. Okay, so C zero. Uh, turns out is like the z value. So I'll just call it z for now. So I need a x and a y. Okay. All right, so what are those? So, uh, you know, again, here's my sort of lower hemisphere projection. And, right, if this is vertical. Say so I have a well drawn in that direction. Well, this guy right here is uh, is phi rather. It's phi. Uh, that's angle. Ah. That's phi, right? And so what I want to do, right? I, I, I want to my contour plot is like an aerial view, if you will, right? Or, We're, we're looking down. This, this picture is looking down on the top of that. And so what I want is the projection of this back onto that plane. That would give me that would give me uh, the, the projection of that say, assuming this is drilled straight to the east then okay, let's say I, uh, my x coordinate is straight to the east, then the projection of that, that's just the, the, the cosine of, of this angle, cosine of speed. And so, um, A 
or rather the sine, the sine. It's the sine. So, so I have the sine of phi j times the sine of delta i. Sine phi j times the cosine delta i. So those are my x, y, and now I have z. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is, you know, MATLAB, it, it would actually store all those values on the fly if I just ran this code, but, you know, it'll run a lot faster if you pre allocate the memory, right? And so in this case, um, I'm going to pre-allocate x, y, and z. They're all n by n matrices or arrays of zeros, right? So x, y, and z. This is just for efficiency. So now these are the ij entries of those guys. Okay. Now, yeah. So like sine phi is the quantity out of the center of the circle. What is sine delta? It's just going around, right? So delta is delta is the azimuth of the toe of the well in the in the plane of the earth, right? So I'm just I'm now just going around from zero to three sixty. So delta goes from zero to sixty. So basically what this would do is going to create, again, looking down, it's going to create a bunch of discrete points in concentric circles, right? Where delta is this angle and phi, well, this, the sine of phi is that, is r, right? The sine of phi is r, and, and this is delta. So it, it goes around. Now, I want to create this contour plot. And uh, if you know anything about contour plots in, Mat, in MATLAB, they, don't, they, wanna, they only work on a regular grid, right? a regular Cartesian grid. This is not a regular, you know, I have this concentric, I have these discrete points in concentric circles. That's not a regular grid. You know what I mean when I say regular grid? Regular grid, like square grid with, with regular grid space. And so to create, to, to do this, you know, so what MATLAB wants is a regular grid, right? So points like this. Right. And so the idea here is I want to interpolate the values of those black dots onto the blue dots. And the way you do that is a function called grid data. So uh, the first thing I'll do is, is create my regular grid. It's going to go from 0 to 1, uh, minus 1 to 1. And again, I'll use <coughs> n points, I'm just, x, x, and y, y are just sort of placeholder variables for the moment. And then I can create my regular grid with mesh grid. So x, g, y, g. So these are the x and y of my regular grid locations. And I create that from the mesh grid function of x, x, and y, y. And then I can, then my ZG is grid data X, Y, and Z. So I want to interpolate X, Y, and Z onto X, G, Y, G. So that's going to return ZG. And from that, I can then create a plot. So figure one is going to be a field contour plot 
xg, yg, zg. Uh, I'll make the axis equal so that my circle looks like a circle. And I'll tell it to show the color bar. And so then I should be able to save this and then uh, call it with some arguments. So uh, my function is uh, create lowest, lower hemisphere plot. The first argument is the stress tensor. So that is on the diagonal 145, 125, 70. Um, so I think I should be able to use the diag function to do this. 145, 125, 70. I think that does what I want it to do, right? Diag, 145, 125, 70. Yep. Okay. So then, um, oh. Then the, the geographic angles, I don't really know uh, what this angle is, but let's just say it's a problem. I mean, that's 45 degrees, so let's call it 50 degrees, something like that. That's alpha, would be 50 for this revolt, reverse faulting regime. Um, you can figure that out yourself. Yeah. But that would be alpha is 50, and then the other two angles are zero. And what else do we need? We need um, nu and mu. So a good value for Poisson ratio for a rock is 0.2. A decent value for internal friction angle is 1. Uh, the pore pressure is 32, and the mud weight is 32. Right? So 32, 32. And the last argument is how coarse I want my plot to be. Uh, I missed a closing bracket there. Um, do what? Evaluate. Well, uh, what's misspelled? No, I think I think I put. Oh, you think here? Yeah, but that's I I, I typed a zero here. That's a zero. Okay, well we have two minutes left, so I have a backup plan. Okay, here's my backup plan. I already wrote the functions. Uh, yeah, so there's a little air warning that pops up. It's just because we sweep over the same point twice, and it's just warning us about that. So when we're using the interpolation, it's just saying you pick one. Uh, but other than that, you know, I guess I forgot some semicolons somewhere because it's plotting out some stuff, and that's probably slowing it down a little bit. Uh, see if I can find that real quick before I. Anyway, uh, so let's just real. Just give me two seconds here. So let's if I switch one. 25 to say 125 and run it. And you definitely don't want the stuff to print the screen like that. Yeah. So the week of the test we had right now, 31st, we went to a conference in Kansas City. 
like Wednesday to, uh, to the weekend. So if we do have it that week, can I take it? Early? Yeah, we'll figure okay. something out. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll leave that for the recording.